I've spoken to a few Rotary Clubs over the years in previous uh, positions around the country, so it's very nice to get to the original first club on this occasion. And it's probably good that Kerry's somewhere in South America at the moment, so um, she won't be able to hear what, I, what I'm saying and, or can disagree with anything if I get it wrong. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our next three-year marketing strategy. We're required to come up with a three-year strategy for the government. Um, for anyone, it's not clear that we are 100% owned by the, the government. Um, and we come up with a three-year strategy. Um, the next one is due to take effect from the 1st of July, so we're really looking at what we're going to be doing to market New Zealand as an inter internationally as a destination over the next three years. We're in a situation where there's a, an enormous number of macro drivers for the industry that we have to try and take into account, and I won't go through all of these, but um, talking about tourism numbers in Wellington, obviously that's partly driven off cruise growth. There's been a massive growth in, in cruise liners, and um, New Zealand's certainly seen that, and Wellington's benefiting from that. Um, an ageing global population, um, that changes the tourism mix. Uh, digital media is mentioned there, increasingly digital focus, um, and, and people expect the growth of, the, of online is relentless. Um, the world's getting more and more of its information online. Social media is becoming increasingly important, so these are all influences on, on tourism. Of course, the GFC and the continuing problem in the Eurozone um, have impact on, on travellers. So we have seen a big decline in visitors from the UK in particular, and that's um, something that uh, is concerning us. The strong New Zealand dollar and the strong Australian dollar, those are having big impacts, um, especially on dual destination visitors. Uh, but on the, I guess on the brighter side, emergence of the East, real growth coming out of some of the Asian markets. Um, and there's other items up there, the fuel costs and the impacts that's had on airlines and so forth. So it's a very dynamic situation um, at the moment um, for the tourism market and trying to work out what you do next. This graph shows the last 10 years and the, 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 the dotted line is arrivals. Uh, the top line is uh, total arrivals and down below holiday because obviously not all people come to New Zealand on holiday. About, a bit over half of arrivals are holiday arrivals, the rest are what are called VFR, uh, visiting friends and relatives, which is a large sector, business, education, and, and so forth. What we've seen is that there's um, a long-term, reasonably slow but steady growth in total arrivals, um, mostly driven from um, that visiting friends and relatives. Uh, on the lower lines, you can see that holiday arrivals are pretty flat, and the dotted lines are stay days, so that's how many days um, people are staying on average, and that's falling. Now, the reason that's falling is that um, really it reflects a change in the visitor mix. We're getting more Australian and Chinese visitors who tend to stay for shorter periods and, and fewer British visitors, for example. So, so the, the, the current picture of the last 10 years is okay, but not particularly rosy. And when you look at how much people are spending, uh, our international visitors are spending quite a lot less. Um, we're actually back to about 2000 or 2001 levels um, in terms of visitor expenditure. Um, there's two main reasons for that. Um, our, those VFR, those visiting friends and relatives, they've gone from 33% to 42% of total arrivals into New Zealand. And so they're still, we still welcome them, but they tend to spend less um, per visitor, per night, they obviously spend less in commercial accommodation because they're generally staying with, staying with friends and family. So that, that's had an impact on uh, tourism expenditure dropping. And the other big impact has been the exchange rate. Um, spending um, by markets like Germany has fallen significantly. Very interestingly though, if you look at what they're spending in their own currency, so what they're spending in euros or pounds, sterling, or US dollars, they're actually spending as much or even more than they ever did, but it's not buying as many Kiwi dollars. So there's probably about a 25% impact just from the exchange rate. And really, you know, no one can predict where exchange rates are going to go, but we're not banking on them improving anytime soon in terms of helping us with the, the tourism dollar. The various markets are um, performing in very different ways. Uh, obviously the number sticking out there is China, up almost 38% in the last year. Uh, just phenomenal growth continuing to come out of China and New Zealand was full of Chinese in February for Chinese New Year. Um, Japan's a really interesting story. That's declined significantly from its highs of a decade ago. 
and uh, Japan is a market that reacts very badly to natural disasters. So both with the Christchurch earthquake and with their own earthquake and tsunami, their, their travels um, fell markedly. In the last five or six months, we've seen a huge turnaround. And for the last year now, Japan is up 16%, and that's all off the last few months. So Japan's coming back quite well. The USA there is back to almost flat, and they've been down quite markedly, and they've come back very strongly in the last two months, two to three months, just a, um, a real switch around there, which is good, and we think at least part of that's due to the Hobbit. Um, the Malaysia figure there, you see a long way down, and that's because for a while we had um, a budget airline, AirAsia X, flying into New Zealand, um, and it that's part of the demand-supply equation. That, that, that was some supply that came into the market unexpectedly, and it got filled up. There were cheap fares out of Malaysia. We had a whole lot of visitors to Malaysia. Um, they still couldn't fill them up fully enough. They couldn't make money on the route, and they stopped it, went away again, and so there was a, there was a blip in visitors from Malaysia, and, and, and now we um, aren't able to sustain that because we simply don't have the airline, uh, they don't have the aircraft to put the people into. And the UK is the most disappointing number there. It's actually been worse. It was, it was a, a decline in the 20% range only a few months ago. So the UK is starting to stabilise a little bit in the last few months, but still, still struggling a lot. And, and where are our top markets? Um, it's important to, to realise that Australia is providing 45% of our visitors. So it's, it dominates. Um, and so it's very, very important. Um, and... Australia's flat at the moment for us over the last few years. That's mainly because the Australians have never had it so cheap to go to the US or Europe. And those, those long-held um, ambitions to go to those destinations have been realised in the last year or two. Um, and they go to the States and actually get some money back for their currency. So um, we, we perhaps get more visitors um, and growth out of Australia when their economy's not doing so well. China has leapt into second place in importance, raced past the UK and the USA in the last six months or so, and I don't think those, um, I don't think China will be caught now. We expect that to double over the next few years. But the UK and USA, while they've been struggling, are still obviously very important. Japan, as I mentioned, is coming back, and Germany's the other um, big market, and Germany's been pretty um, solid and steady. So th those are the key markets for us. What have we been doing um, recently? You may have heard about um, our 100% Middle Earth, 100% Pure New Zealand campaign, so very much tied into The Hobbit, um, part of all the whole um, uh, deal with, that the government had with, with Warners, which has had, had a lot of airing. But from our point of view, it's been a fantastic opportunity to piggyback off The Hobbit movie, um, leverage that, um, and use that promotion. Now, I won't play this video today, but on our website, newzealand.com, so it's probably one of the easiest websites to remember, newzealand.com, um, on the home page is the video um, at the moment which is now coming out on the DVD. So the Hobbit DVD which has come, has come out in the US, it's not out here yet. Every DVD in its special features has a special tourism promotion on New Zealand. And that's one of the things we got out of the deal with Warners. Uh, it's been done by Peter Jackson. I mean, if you get the opportunity to go on the website, it's six minutes long. Um, it's um, a fantastic promotion of New Zealand. It's all the actors saying what an incredible place this country is. So it's, it's that third party endorsement. It, it's, it's brilliant. Now, um, just got a question for the audience. Does, has anyone here heard of someone called Yao Chen? Hopefully John here. Okay, we're about four. Well, Yao Chen is an absolute phenomenon. This is Yao Chen. Um, She's been Tourism New Zealand's brand ambassador in China since 2011. She's an actress. She's also uh, the queen of Weibo. Weibo is the Chinese equivalent of, of uh, Facebook and Twitter. She currently has 44 million followers. <laughs> and uh, the, the biggest uh, person on uh, Twitter is Justin Bieber. And he has about 36 million followers. So she's the most followed person in the world on social media. When we picked her up, she had only about 10 million um, followers. So we, um, we obviously we lucked in or made a very wise choice when we, we selected her as brand ambassador. Um, so we, we brought her to New Zealand for a photo shoot. Um, she fell in love with New Zealand so much that she decided to get married in Queenstown in November last year. That's 
this is a, um, from her wedding in Queenstown. Um, she and some of her very, very VIP friends from China came out for that wedding. Um, it was massive publicity back in um, China. Um, she, she got married, then she did a, a second photo shoot for us, and then she came to Wellington and walked down the red carpet for the Hobbit premiere. Pretty much ignored by New Zealand and uh, Western media, absolutely dominated Asian media. She was the one that featured in all the cover coverage. Um, so during that period, we, we stopped counting at about 7,000 separate media articles or online articles covering her um, time in New Zealand. Um, there's a thing called advertising equivalent value when you, when you get news coverage and you can sort of per centimetre work out what it would be worth if you'd had to buy that advertising. We got at least $50 million worth of advertising in China in those couple of weeks from, from Yao Chen. So she's, a, she's, she's a, one of the reasons why we're doing so well in China. She's um, uh, incredible. Um, and uh, we'll have to see where we go with her, whether we've got everything out of her that we can, but she is certainly um, a, a big plus for us. <laughs> Because it is a commercial relationship. <laughs> Although there are a lot of people who would actually like to spend more time in her company. But that's... Um, other things we're doing, we do regional campaigns. So it's not all about 100% um, Middle Earth um, and in China with the Ao Chen. We do regional campaigns like these. These are um, done with the, the, with the RTOs, the Regional Tourism Organisation. So this one involved um, positively Wellington Tourism plus uh, Nelson, Blenheim, uh, Hawke's Bay, Wairapa, and this was a, a food and wine campaign that went into uh, Australia. And we've done a South Island one and a North Island one. We do a whole lot of these regional campaigns in Australia in particular. Uh, and we do a big ski campaign. There's another ski campaign in the market at the moment. Um, I was just saying at our table before that um, Queenstown is now the number one Australian ski resort. More Australians go to Queenstown than to any Australian ski resort. Um, and they're just flying in there in, in huge numbers. So that's, you know, that's another success story. And um, Tourism New Zealand, um, for my sins, I'm chair of Eyesight New Zealand. So Tourism New Zealand uh, sort of manages the branding of Eyesight, the visitor information network. Their own, there's 80 odd of them around the country. They're owned generally by the local councils or the local regional tourism organisations. There's some other um, ownership models. We provide some over guidance um, in terms of training and branding. And this branding is at the airport. You may have seen this at Wellington Airport or at Auckland Airport if you're travelling through. Uh, and these are eyesight. These are actually the eyesight staff from Wellington Eyesight over at the town hall. So we're using real people and stressing the fact in this digital age when people can travel New Zealand with their devices that the eyesight still have an incredibly important role because you go in and you meet the experts face to face and you get that local knowledge. So that's where we're, we're pushing eyesights at the moment. So that's where we are. Where do we go to now? Um, we've got this next three-year strategy. We have to try to predict what's going to be needed um, in the future and, ha and how we continue to increase the value of tourism to New Zealand. So our goal is not just getting numbers through the door, not just getting people into New Zealand. We want the right sort of visitors and it's all about what value they add to New Zealand. We're going through a, a, a process of coming up with a strategy. We're getting towards the end of it. We should have had a final draft in March. It's Pretty final, but some other interesting developments just recently. But we will have a final strategy signed off. Um, it's tied in, of course, with the government's budget process. So on um, on the 16th of May, when the budget's announced, or possibly in a pre-budget announcement, um, it'll be our strategy will, will be out um, for the next three years. We went out to the industry to, to really get some um, input into the strategy. So we, we had a roadshow around the country that uh, Kerry Prendergast uh, was involved with, along with Kevin Bowler, our CEO. Uh, we had an online survey that had 700 people uh, from the sector take part. So we got a lot of information. Um, the sector was telling us we do need to have a greater focus on quality visitors. We are not a cheap destination. And with our exchange rate where it is, there's no prospect of that. Um, turning around, so we have to sell New Zealand as a high-end destination where you still get good value for money, but you get good quality. Um, we need to keep a, a balanced uh, market portfolio, can't just go after one or two things, and we're really looking deep into that, what, into what that means in terms of where we do spend our money and how wide we do spread our net. Um, broaden the focus to include building preference, that's about 
we have operated a little bit in the conversion space, working with people that out there in the world that we know already want to come to New Zealand and we work to convert them to get them to book the, the travel. We're also going to do a bit more work on, on preference. Um, those make get, Getting their preference for travel to New Zealand higher up their list. I'll talk about that a bit more shortly. We do a, almost everything we do in partnership. Um, we work with airlines, we work with big, big travel companies, we work with the regional tourism organisations. Um, we always are looking to work in partnership with other operators so that we're coordinated, we combine our money, we get better value out of what we're spending. Um, we certainly have to have, be sure that the next three year plan is flexible because we had the Christchurch earthquake occur in the last three year plan, so things happen that you just simply can't predict. And we also want to have a longer term perspective. We have done some thinking out five to ten years and some of the bigger, the bigger macro drivers um, rather than just keeping it to a three year term. So, <clears throat> so what are we thinking at the moment? That our current high level priorities generally make sense. Um, they will be fine tuned and um, there will be some, some fiddling and changes but there's nothing particularly broken with where we're focusing our efforts at the moment. Um, there are some emerging opportunities that show a great deal of promise. This is both uh, emerging markets, as developing countries have a rising middle class who have an appetite to travel, there's real opportunities in those emerging markets to, to do more. And within markets, and within those markets and existing markets, different sectors, there's specific age groups we can target. Um, there's a very interesting age group called, that we're calling the active baby boomer. Uh, so as, as, as the baby boomers come through, there's going to be a very large uh, active baby boomers. So those are, those are people who are over 65 but are still fit and healthy. And, and their idea of a holiday in New Zealand may be to come and go cycling for 10 days, not come and sit on a cruise ship and, and go around. So it's a whole segment of active older people who... Um, and are probably going to be a lot more active and a lot more engaged in the sort of holiday that they want than we would have traditionally thought of, of the older traveller. So we don't think we're going to be... Um, we're not going to be starting again. We've just got some interesting things to, to look at. I talked about um, preference against conversion. So what we, what we call it is moving up the funnel. So at the top you've got people who are just dreaming of a holiday. Then they're considering, and they've got New Zealand on their list. We may be number five, four, three, two, or one on their list of where they want to go for the next holiday. Then they start planning their holiday, then they book it, and then they're talking to their friends and family and advocating for New Zealand. Yeah, but sometimes before they even get here, but certainly afterwards. Now we've spent quite a lot of focus towards the end, getting them to book. Um, we're going to move, try in the next three years, move up a bit further, more into that um, dreaming and considering phase. To see, if, and um, the Hobbit helps with this. There's going to be people attending, going to the Hobbit movie or watching the DVD, who may not have New Zealand on their bucket list at the moment. But after seeing that, it's on there. So how do we get them to then go? Not it's just one of the places I like to visit to get them to make it the place they want to visit. Some themes will certainly carry on for the next three years. Middle Earth will for a while, maybe not for the whole three-year strategy, but the, the next um, movie is out in November, um, and so we'll be doing something around that, and then a year later, the third movie. So um, there will be some sort of Middle Earth theme um, running through for the next year or two. It's not going to dominate um, everything we do, but it will certainly be there. It's, it, it provides the cut-through. Um, you, you can't um, underestimate... Uh, how many people you can go to and speak to overseas that the only thing they know about New Zealand is that the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were made there. That's the only thing they know. They don't know about the All Blacks in certain markets. Um, so uh, it's still going to be important for us to, to keep that Middle Earth theme going. We're really excited about the, the opportunities that special interests um, offer. Uh, the, I sort of mentioned that with the active baby boomers. These are, these are um, visitors to New Zealand who aren't coming here for what you consider a normal holiday. I'll, I'll come and see what the sites are. They're coming with a purpose. So they want to go uh, freshwater angling. They want to play seven of our best golf courses. They want to cycle six of our new cycle trails. Um, they want to go to five different um, wine regions. So they're, they're coming with a specific interest in mind. The, region, the reason these uh, visitors are so valuable is they stay longer and spend a lot more money. So they're, 
there are much more um, value to us than, uh, I guess, a stock standard um, tourist. So we, we are looking very closely at how we can target these special interest groups, which means we go almost outside of the tourism industry in some case. Do, are we going to um, specific cycling shows that are about cycling, not about tourism, because we can, we can um, uh, get, get an audience there and convince them to come for their, for their cycling trip in New Zealand next time. Business events are uh, another great opportunity. We run a thing called the Conference Assistance Programme. That's available to any association or organisation that's looking to bid for an international conference uh, of at least 200 delegates. And we, we can help with a financial feasibility study, um, custom bid documents, strategic marketing, um, and, uh, and uh, hopefully with our partners assisting with air travel if you have to go off to, to, to present a bid in another location around the world. So the CAP scheme is working really well. We're getting some bids in. If, and I shouldn't say if, I should say when, we get some new conference facilities, um, when we get one in Auckland, when we get one in Christchurch, when we get one in Queenstown, um, Wellington's reasonably well served for, at a certain level for conference facilities. Um, we have the opportunity to really build in this space, to really get um, conferences coming, business events coming, and um, really benefiting, not just from the people who come to those conferences, um, but building um, tourism profile around that. Maori culture is, is New Zealand's unique point of difference. We went out to the industry and asked them what they thought about how much we were doing with Maori culture at the moment as Tourism New Zealand. Should we do less about the same or do more? Uh, the, the feedback was we should be, um, people were basically in two camps, uh, uh, we're doing it about right or you should do more. There were very few, should we do, should we thought we should do less. So we were, we were very happy with that. Um, we do want to do more, we would, uh, but we do need to integrate it. It's, it's not tokenism, it's, uh, it's got to be, it's got to be, go well beyond tokenism. We've got to make it um, integrated into um, what we're doing. And I know that the PM is currently over in China with a business delegation, including our CEO, Kevin Bowler. Um, he's taken a Kapahaka group with him. And every meeting in China, the Kapahaka group is performing. Um, it, it may seem strange on a business delegation to have 10 out of the 100-odd uh, Kapahaka group, but they will be enormously beneficial in China. They, I mean, they, that's a point of difference for New Zealand. No other country is turning up with that sort of... Um, uh, cultural um, signature, if you like. Going for the next three years, we will continue to play um, mostly in the digital space. Uh, I saw some figures the other day on how much gets spent on advertising around the world, and it's just a massive amount of money. Um, the amount of money that we can spend is tiny. And, and while we do do a little bit of TV advertising, a little bit of newspaper and, and um, magazine, most of our advertising is actually digital online. Um, and directing people um, back to our website, NewZealand.com. So we will continue to stay using those digital channels. Um, we're getting reasonably sophisticated these days in, in how we target that so we can, we can um, and you get a lot of information back when you're in the digital space about how, who you're reaching and how well your uh, money's been spent. So um, that will continue to be um, a big focus for us working in, uh, on the online space. Having said that, PR um, remains central to our strategy. So what we do in that space is um, we bring media to New Zealand. Uh, in the last financial year, it was about 225 different media outlets came to New Zealand. These media have to have a guaranteed outlet for their story. So we will go to say that our London office will negotiate with the Guardian travel editor. He'll agree that he'll come out. He wants he wants to look at. Uh, you may want to look at um, Hobbit locations, film locations, or we might want to look at food and wine, or, or whatever it is. We'll, we'll arrange all that with him before he comes. He'll tell us how many pages are going to, we're going to get in The Guardian before it comes out. We'll look to get a cheap um, discounted airfare with one of the airlines to bring him over. We'll work with all the operators, we'll put him up for free or discounted around the country. Um, so basically he'll come out and get a, a free trip to New Zealand, go back, we get guaranteed coverage in The Guardian newspaper. It's a um, it's very effective investment for us. We spend, uh, in that financial year, about a million dollars. Um, the regional tourism organisations and, and the tourism operators probably provided about a million dollars worth of services on top of that. And again, using that uh, advertising equivalent um, calculation, we got about $74 million worth of coverage. So um, yeah, some people struggle to understand why, we, why you give media freebies to come visit your country, but basically every, every destination does it. 
you read our own papers and read the travel sections, you'll see that there have been usually travelled to so-and-so with the support of so-and-so. So, -and -so. so um, it, it really does work. Um, and we've got a team that's, that's very good at um, identifying who are the right people to bring out on those sort of things. We do something similar with trade. So we bring travel agents and travel bosses often to New Zealand, um, close to 500 in that financial year. Um, and so we, in a similar way, we bring them to New Zealand and we take them around and we give them the best that New Zealand has to offer. So when they're back, they know how to sell New Zealand. It's very hard for someone to sell New Zealand in Germany or France or Canada or anywhere else if they haven't been to New Zealand. Um, so we do bring, um, in May, we're bringing uh, about 300 uh, key travel agents to New Zealand um, to show them the best of what we have to offer so that they're able to sell us when they get back. We also um, attend trade events around the world and we run 11 of our own around the world. Um, we've just taken a whole lot of uh, New Zealand operators through Southeast Asia and Japan and Korea. We, we, we organise the shows and we put them in front of the, the key people in those countries. We have online training, so we run a whole lot of training modules and we have a lot of MOUs with airlines and travel sellers and so forth um, that we work with um, to, uh, to, to spread the dollar as far as we can. And, and all, that, all of that's going to continue, we just get smarter and, and, and I mentioned how you know, online is increasingly important, but working directly with the trade is, is, is going to remain important for the next three years. So just recapping, we, you know, we think where we currently are is about right, but there are some emerging opportunities that really offer great promise. Um, there will be some changes to how we execute things. We think the amount that we're, we're doing with Middle Earth is about right, we're, we're not overdoing it or undercooking it. Um, really going to have a focus on value and quality in the strategy. We really have to, and, and there we need the industry to help us with that. The industry has to have its, raise its game. It has to provide a quality service to the visitor because the visitor is, is going to know that it's, it's uh, not um, necessarily a cheap experience they're having, so it has to be a quality experience. Digital remains very uh, core. We are going to have a, a really good look at special interests and, and really trying to tap into those special interest areas. Uh, there's the business events as well. Uh, NewZealand.com, our website, we're in the um, final stages now of developing a mobile app for that. Um, so that, that possibly will be more use for the visitor once they get to New Zealand. So they've got an app on their phone or device that they can um, find the information that's rele uh, relevant to where they, as they travel around the country. Um, PR and trade um, may be considered a little old-fashioned approach, but they will remain essential, and, and we're going to look at how we can uh, apply uh, Maori culture. How am I doing for time? Here? Just time, time for questions. Um, I'll quickly show this slide. When I say we're looking beyond three years, I won't go into the details, but there are some big picture um, developments over, that go beyond three years. You know, the fast-growing markets. There are markets that we get very few visitors from at the moment. Um, some of the South American markets, for example, Russia, um, these markets are going to need attention um, in the longer term. Um, really trying to understand what social media is going to do. Uh, we would love Wi Fi, free Wi Fi, to be far more available in New Zealand because the, most tourists expect to be able to update their Facebook or tweet or do something as they travel around. And, and those endorsements are, are just priceless. If someone's just had a bungee jump or just had a fantastic service in a restaurant and they get on their device and tell their friends and family about that there and then, it's great. If they try to do it and there's no Wi-Fi or it drops out or it's, um, they may then uh, update their Facebook a week later when they get to, to Wi-Fi and be grumpy and tell, tell, their, world, tell their, their friends and family how bad the Wi-Fi was. So we would love to see New Zealand um, get to a position where people can actually access their um, social media. And the balance of, of um, where visitors are going to come from is going to keep changing. Um, aviation liberalisation is continuing, so we don't see any um, lessening of links. In fact, there's, there's going to be opportunities. One of the, one of the uh, exciting possibilities, and, and we can only influence it in a very small way, is New Zealand becoming a hub for travel between South America and Asia, particularly China. Um, it's not an easy route to, um, at the moment. Um, New Zealand geographically actually works quite well to, to come to New Zealand and then on to China. Um, we've, we've been talking to air, airlines uh, for a while now, trying to convince them of this is a great idea. They all can see the logic. Um, they can't probably see the numbers yet to justify it, but we'd be hopeful that in the next um, 
maybe three to five years, something may happen in that space. Um, but we also have to realize that you know, there's going to be sh shocks, there's going to be political shocks. Who knows what's happening with North Korea at the moment? That could turn into something that's um, a very bad outcome. Um, even in China right at the moment as well, there's the, uh, the bird flu. So there's all sorts of things um, that could happen, that could, could influence all our best intentions. But uh, on the whole, I think New Zealand's still well placed. The great thing is we have a fantastic product. We know from all our visitor surveys that about 95% of visitors to New Zealand go away very satisfied with their visit. So in terms of us as a marketing organisation, having a product that, that's, that is that strong is a great starting position. Um, so that's why we want people talking about New Zealand, because it's overwhelmingly positive. So um, we think on the whole, things are looking pretty good. Thank you.